cities and the environment. Now, I know you already looked at several of these slides, but I'm just going to elaborate a bit more on some, etc. One of them, I understand that we did not talk about this last class. Uh, the, the question of, so this is hot, this is very hot, and this is extremely hot. And one thing that has happened, now we don't know when this history of land getting hotter and hotter, when it exactly starts, because you know in the past we may have had that. But it is certainly the case that in the last few decades, we have seen land getting hotter and hotter. When land gets hot, it may still look like it's alive, but it's on its deathbed. Huh? So, so luckily, the extremely hot is not as marked you know, as, as the medium hot. But this is a very bad sign. Also a footnote, and maybe some of you who are in the sciences have, have good data. It's not so easy, actually, to get data for the world on this question of uh, hot land, a hot earth. This is really what we're talking about. So if any of you has, you know, I know that some of you are in the sciences, I would really love to see some more detailed data. So, so let, send me an email, alert me, and then we can cover it in the class. Uh, the thing also to notice is that the trend is basically upward. Sometimes if you take a very, very long trend, you see ups and downs and ups and downs, but we are in a mode here where evidently it is going up. And, and I think I mentioned it to you. You know, there are good parts of the Midwest of the United States where you see the surface looks beautiful. You know, all the chemicals that they put in there and who knows what. But actually, that land is dying. So the reading of is it dead or is it fully alive and doing fine gets sort of, uh, gets a bit confusing because of all the chemicals and the variety of elements that they are using in that kind of land. Now, this is the question of the temperature, right? Multiple sources, in other words, you have a whole bunch of sources, many more than that, and also this just ends at 2010, but the trend continues. While there are variations, so one source gives you one set of numbers, the other one gives you another, basically the trend is upwards, which is not good. Um, now here, and these are areas, this is a very rough, you know, you can get much more refined data on this, but just for the, just so that you get a sense, uh, these are all areas, including as you can see the United States, that are really beginning to be very stressed on the water question. Now, part of the story about water, and I have mentioned this before, and in a future lecture I will give you some rather detailed data, is the notion of all the water that is being extracted. I don't know if any of you has read or knows about the fact that, for instance, very rich companies like Nestle, Coca-Cola, are extracting water continuously for almost no money. They don't pay almost any money. And they're doing that in the United States as well. They were thrown out of India from two states because they had managed to exhaust the underground water table. Because all that water that we drink, you know, it comes from somewhere. So the image that I want you to have is sort of the fragility in terms of the supply of all these basic elements from earth that can really grow stuff, earth that is in good shape, to the question of water. It is really a fragile moment. Now we know that some places will have more water than they need and others will have less, et cetera, et cetera, but still overall, we are, um, we're having a problem. And again, if you look at some of the figures on how the water bottling companies, and there are about 25 in the world, how much water they are extracting for no money, and we pay quite a bit of money, that to me is a, really an extreme case that I would argue needs to be addressed, you know, about policymakers, by the political classes. That is an abuse. Uh, at one point, I think I may have mentioned it already, uh, Coca-Cola wanted to install itself here in the New York area. We have a huge, you know, water, how do you call it, reservoir. And the government of New York State said no. They actually did not, which was amazing because in other parts of the country, they let them come, even though they don't pay a lot of money, but they pay some money. So, so this is a whole story unto itself. I'm really curious to know 
How many of you were aware of this water issue? Aha, I'm very glad to see that. Because this is quite a, it almost feels like a new history in the making, this question of water, and how the notion of the limits of these, if you want, natural water supplies. Um, now, this is something that I think I have shown you already. This is the Aral Sea. And what I want to point out here is that it took only 20 years to destroy it. That's a shock. I mean, believe me, when it was like this, there was already the elements of destruction. But to, in such a short period of time, this is one of the biggest internal seas in the world. And look how it went. And then we have this, even more impressive. Maybe a billion years of ice coverage, poof, gone. 20 years. That is shocking. This kind of stuff, these, these are very dramatic images, these two. They're very well-defined zones. But this stuff is happening in micro-environments all across the world. We will never fully recover. But we can, if you want, reduce you know, the, the sharpness of the destruction. Um, now, here is one, you know, as you know, probably there are a lot of debates about the data, etc. There are differences in the different measures. However, overall, there is quite a bit of agreement in terms of measuring how it goes. And it's not going in the right direction, no? How is that? So, the multiple measures confirm sea level rise. Eh? So, this is going to, to be a factor. And as you know, we have these two extremes. We have places where there is no more water, and then we have places where there is too much. So the balance aspect, regrettably, is not there. Now, this to me is a very important graph. This graph shows you how we are, how, how, uh, how the difference that our, if we sort of commit to certain measures as we are currently committing, right? That is the difference, the solid line versus that other line. That is nothing. That's all these countries who have agreed to this and to that and all the kinds of things that we're doing, nothing. Because the curve keeps on going. I mean, it's not nothing, I exaggerate a bit, but de facto, we keep destroying. So we need far more radical modes than the ones that we're dealing with uh, currently. How many of you have seen this curve? OK, good, good. But everybody should. You have to sort of have this ingrained in your, you know, in your brain somewhere, a little room for this kind of stuff. Now, I think that, did he talk about this or not? Did, he, did Adam cover this? Right, so this whole notion that uh, when, when you look at the urban moment of what is a much larger process that involves, of course, also non-urban, the city becomes a very particular kind of place. I, don't you love this one? This was of some sort of cheap movie. Maybe not a cheap movie. Actually, maybe a very expensive movie, but you know, a cheap old movie, so to speak. Now, water scarcity. You saw this in a lot of places. Look at the United States. Now, this is a very generic map, clearly, right? Because there are places where we have too much water. But basically, the scarcities uh, are there. Uh, I'm going to this. You heard about using complexity, right? I want, this is, to me, very important, that the notion of the complex, systemic, and multiscalar capacities of cities are a massive potential. Uh, for a broad range of positive articulations with nature's complex ecologies. If you have a very simple ground, you know, not much, not much can be done. But when you have these kinds of complexities, I, Adam? Right, I've kept invoking you. I'm checking with them what you already talked about. I'm maybe adding just a bit, if I may. <laughs> Will you let me? Okay, very good. Um, so, so think of a city as a multi-scalar 
and also with multiple different uh, containers, if you want, system. And so the question becomes, rather than seeing the city, as is so often done, as sort of this mass of stone, what are you going to do with it vis-a-vis -vis the environmental question, seeing it in its complexity, and hence each element of that complexity can become a vector for intervening and changing something. If you just had one big flat, everything is the same, like a parking lot, you know, that is the size of a five foot ball. What are you going to do with that? Very difficult. It's just one type of surface. When you have a complex system with multiple differentiations, you actually have the possibility of, you know, inserting a whole set of diverse strategies. Um, and, and so for me, one, one critical element that I would really like you to take with you is this notion of bridging the ecologies of cities and of the biosphere. There are multiple ecologies. So I, I uh, have really enjoyed doing a kind of research where I try to understand, you know, how can we bring uh, the biosphere's capacities in play in a city? And there are multiple things. I don't know. I can't remember if there are slides about it, but you will tell me. For instance, one of them is a bacterium that if you paint concrete with it, are you with me? I mean paint. It's like a paint. You, you put it on concrete. That bacterium begins, as it lives its life in concrete, begins to deposit uh, a, a kind of a calcium, you know, something that seals off, and eventually can actually close up bu a building. It's about concrete. The surface has to be concrete. Uh, for other surfaces, other, other elements. And then it actually actively cleans up the air right around. Doesn't clean up the whole city, but right around the, those surfaces, whatever the surface is, it cleans the air around. So if you had a visual from a plane, you would see that everything that is concrete actually has a sort of a cleansing effect around it. That is not enough to eliminate all the bad stuff in a city, but it is an interesting proposition. If every surface of the city, if we can find the elements that make it work with the biosphere in a whole variety of different ways, depending on the surface, you know, we would, it would really be quite amazing. Now, I must tell you, there are countries where there has been far more effort in that direction, like Japan is one of them. You know, what are all the different ways in, we can, in which we can use biospheric capacities to cleanse our cities, to cleanse the surfaces, to whatever, you know. Now, um, and the other thing to think about is, you know, Cities create new social natural conditions. We have all kinds of life in cities. And there are certain cultures where a lot of the insects, they are actually, the residents know, if I may call it that, the utility function of whatever is alive and crawling or whatever is plant and green. We should do that too, you know? When, if we begin to really take the biospheric elements seriously and we begin to understand what all can they do. For instance, I think I already may have mentioned it, but a recent discovery is a bacterium that if you put it in brown waters, brown waters, I think I may have mentioned this to you already, which, you know, what we produce in vast quantities in bathrooms and kitchens, and is a real problem for any city to dispose of. Actually, with time, and the temporality is a very significant element here, with time, that bacterium begins to produce a molecule of a plastic, durable, resistant, and biodegradable. Now, when you think of how we have plastics in everything we do, and secondly, how destructive these, you know, chemical plastics are, then that is a little miracle. And we could do it. And it means that every city can either make the plastic 
out of what now is a burden because disposing of all of that stuff is a massive burden. They don't do it well. It costs money, et cetera, et cetera. If we can think of all the elements that we deal with as also containing within them a possibility, a capacity, you know, depending on how you use it, that would make such a difference. We could do it. We just aren't at all not able or not interested, but I really, I would love it if, uh, if one knew by the time this class is over, I don't mean today, I mean the end of the term, that you really have a sense of all these biospheric capacities and how they could be deployed. And there are countries, of course, that are much better at this than we are, like Denmark, the Netherlands, they know how to use the stuff. You know, they are far more engaged by deploying these biospheric capacities to deal with all kinds of things. The United States is, is I don't know what it is. Do you understand what it is or what? Why is the United States not more engaged with that kind of stuff? There are scientists of all sorts who are doing this, but at the level of governance, at the level of running a city, it's, it's quite amazing to me who, you know, I, I basically also spend a lot of time in Europe, how different it is here. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the money question. Why is the United States with all the amazing research labs there are, with all the amazing battalions of brilliant scientists. Why aren't we deploying that the way they're doing it, say, in a country like Denmark or the Netherlands? So that, that to me, always remains as a, I mean, most countries in the world are not, let me clarify. But there are, a country like ours should, because we have so many scientists, so many knowledgeable people. We have a pile of money but the money's all going into other things, and that's one little problem. Now, this probably you covered already, right? So I don't need to do this, but this is very important. The fact that the city is multiscalar means that you can aggregate stuff. You know, you have multiplier effects. You have different points of entry. It is not a flat surface. We underuse these particular features of that construct that we call a city. We have the knowledges to make different levels, different surfaces work with a biosphere. Not all of them, huh? Plastic like that, very tough. I don't know what that is, but it looks like plastic. But we could, that could actually be a different kind of plastic, you know, plastic that is made organically. Um, okay, I want to move on here. Mm. Now, this is self-evident, but I just want you to have it inscribed in your minds. And that is that when you're dealing with a city, the actual zone from the world that a city, a city like New York, big city, is extracting from, is using, is dependent on, is huge. It's huge. The footprint of a big city on the global scale is huge. And there the question is, you know, how far can a city go to actually generate a bit more in-house, so to speak, you know, within the space of the city? Like what I was describing before about this bacterium that if you put it in brown waters, it actually begins to produce a molecule of a plastic, durable, resistant, but biodegradable. Hey, that it would be a real positive. And we are continuously dealing, that is a major problem and a major cost, is disposing of brown waters. In fact, it's a prime matter. As we say in Spanish, materia prima, you know, something with which you can make something else. But we don't do that. And it goes on and on. I mean, there are many, many such examples. Um, now, is this a clear concept? This to me is, this seems to me very important. And that is the notion that the complexity of urban space, this mixture of elements that you have, actually sort of mobilizes, is one image. You could use other terms. Maybe mobilize is not the simplest term to understand it with. But you could actually mobilize new kinds of social ecological systems. Now, there are cities in the world that are ahead, again, of, of US cities in terms of doing that, mobilizing whatever the city has. Paris is much better than New York. 
Uh, and certainly some of the smaller European cities are just amazing. They are really, you know, using whatever they can use. Um, okay, I'm just going to move on. Now, finally, when you're dealing with a city, especially the city as a system, the question of scaling, you understand what we mean by scaling, right? Scaling is not just different levels. Scaling means that something changes when you jump at another level. So the city has multiple scalings. You could take the vertical dimensions, you could take the, the horizontal dimensions. If you're really serious about maximizing how you can use the biosphere, how you can use whatever the, the, the items that would mean that the city is working with a biosphere, then you have multiple opportunities. And you need also many very different forms of knowledge, types of intelligences, et cetera, et cetera. This should be one of the most exciting, I don't know most exciting, but it should be an exciting challenge, an amazing set of knowledge vectors that take you to so many different forms of knowledge, the, a whole range of stuff in the sciences, a whole range of stuff that might come from people who know about anthropology and, and people who know about natural plants, what, what trees to grow. For instance, by the way, one talking about trees, one thing that is happening in a lot of landscaping is the planting of a certain kind of tree, a tree that barely needs water, a tree that is sort of indestructible. That sounds very impressive. That is not necessarily always the best tree to have in terms of allowing it to work with whatever is in that space, from the earth to the quality of the air to the way it gets used, et cetera, et cetera. There is so much really uh, interesting knowledge that, you know, it's like our, our what do we call it, municipal governments, hey, they, they just don't, you know. And I, I, have, a, I have the same thing with, uh, I think I may have mentioned it with the municipal governments, you know, when they get visited by the techies, they basically let the techies tell them what they should buy. We're now talking, you know, various digitals and stuff like that instead of having a session before the techies come to visit them with the staff of the municipal government saying, what do we need? What do we need? How could we benefit from certain kinds of technologies? And then when the techies come, the firms, the municipal government crowd would say, you know what? Can you help us with this? We need this and that. Rather than having that other side, they just tell you and they're trying to sell you stuff which you often don't need. You know, these are little, just like you might think of them as little, little ways of inverting an inversion of the usual practice that could really open up, you know, a whole, a whole other domain. Um, okay, this again, this is pretty self-evident. And this is a challenge, it's complex, but we can do it. Huh? Reorienting the material and organizational ecologies of cities. Can anybody think of an example, what that would mean? Can you think of that? In other words, you have to reorient something. You have A, B, C. Right now they're working together in a certain way. How do you rearrange them so that they work in a different way? Okay, you can, we're not going, I'm just going to move on here. Um, now, to me, one thing that, that is really, sort of interesting, beautiful, et cetera, et cetera, is this notion of delegating back to the biosphere what she does well or best. And here you have a whole range of scientific findings and you know, there is really a lot of material on this. Let the biosphere do it rather than us do it with chemicals or whatever, like cleaning up a water body. Uh, so rather than short-circuiting biocycles with problematic technology, we can delegate back to the biosphere. Now this delegating back to the biosphere is a bit of an abstract notion, but you know what I'm getting at, right? It's sort of, it's something that we should be doing much more of. These are old examples, well-established places, et cetera, et cetera. There is a lot of new stuff happening. Now, specific features of cities that help regarding the environment. So let me throw this back as a question to you all. What would be 
some of the features that mark a city that actually, you know, help the, the question of the environment, of working with the environment. Can anybody think of examples? In Chicago, for instance, Chicago is ahead of New York. <laughs> you know, those cities are always competing. In this case, Chicago is ahead. Now it's absolutely required to plant trees and put greenery on certainly the roofs and then also the sides. In Paris, this is required stuff now, that you have to have the, the, the vertical surfaces covered with green. The Chinese have gone ballistic. I don't know if people have seen it. All the new cities now, we have trees, trees, trees ev everywhere, sort of building actually trees. You make place in buildings, not just on the ceiling, but also on the lateral sides where you have trees or big bushes. So there is a lot of that stuff happening. You know, these are all partial interventions, but it is interesting to see that. We should be working so hard at at collectivizing all kinds of moments, you know, of the situations, etc. And it's just, it's tough. Partly it's tough, I think, because there's so much alienation in a city like New York, because there's such income difference, there's so many, so much sort of social injustice, poverty, etc., you name it. Those are real obstacles. That's part of the human condition, you know. We, we mess it up very often. But there are Really, like I said, in Chicago, all roofs need to be green so people are planting. In the Netherlands, a lot of planting of, of uh, vegetables happens on roofs or on terraces, etc. But think of every surface in the city. Now, I mentioned about this bacterium that if you put it on concrete, begins to seal off. That is just one example of what we could do with surfaces. What is a challenge is artificial materials. That's sort of dead. Whereas if it's not artificial, it often is alive and you can work with it. Non-scientific elements are significant in cities. In other words, people and such. So I wanted to give you some examples here. Uh, this is local governments. This, is, this goes back to an earlier era where the whole question of the environmental, of environmental protection and recognition was not as well established. And it was interesting to see that the national government was absolutely regressive on this issue, whereas uh, states, not even cities, but states, were far more active in recognizing. And so here, and they launched a whole bunch of lawsuits against, uh, Whatever, it, whatever the entities that they were suing for not taking enough care about this environmental issue. And these are some of those states, and they're quite a, quite a mix, as you can see. Uh, so local governments and courts fought the EPA. This is something that begins in 207. In other words, the, the, these, these actors, these entities, were far more aware of the need to address the environmental question then then was Washington DC, basically, right? This is a very uh, good, so here you have, you can read a bit of this, you know, July, the head of the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, stated that the thought that carbon emissions should be dealt with by Congress, basically there was a fight, there was a fight on the part of, of states against the national government, for the national government not you know, demanding better regulation, more restrictions, etc. So the states sue the, e the EPA, for instance, over vehicle emissions. Now, also, to, I don't know if you people follow this at all, but in the last few weeks, again, the national level EPA downgraded uh, requirements, etc., in a way that, that other localities, other levels, you know, it varies a bit, did not. So these 17 states and the District of Columbia actually sued the EPA over vehicle emissions because the EPA was saying, no, vehicle emissions is fine, not to worry. And they wanted better levels. I mean, in other words, lower levels of emissions. Um, and so, for instance, there, you know, in 2006, California legislated a plan to reduce carbon emissions to 1990 levels. Pretty ambitious, actually, by 2020. This included a 30% reduction in vehicle tailpipe, wow, that's a word that I've never used, tailpipe, but I'm sure you know what that is, right? That's where the emissions come out of, right? Tailpipe, what a word. 
You know, when you hear a word for the first time, you actually see it, tailpipe. What is that? OK, by 2020. Now, December 2007, the Federal Court of Appeals ruled that California, I mean, it, it went to the courts, you understand, against the national government. You would have thought that the national government was the pusher. The Federal Court of Appeals ruled that California could limit car emissions with a waiver from the EPA. The EPA denied California's request to impose greenhouse gas emissions limits on motor vehicles. Do you understand how weird this is or not? Do you understand it or not? I mean, the states were fighting in a way that the national government was not. The national government has a dedicated environmental protection agency, and they were out to lunch, basically. They were doing nothing. I mean, to me, this is absolutely shocking. So anyhow, enough of that. You can see that it goes on, and it goes on and on. Los Angeles went to court. I, mean, I, I just, the one thing that is, that is interesting here is that the states took the national government or national agencies to court. That doesn't happen in too many countries. You know, we have a thing with the law that everybody can sort of, you know. Well, the states did it too. The federal government has obstructed measures, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is bad. I don't know who was president then. Who was president in 2007? Clinton, no. George W. Bush. <laughs> George W. Bush, I heard, I heard of him, right, and I heard it, right. So anyhow, over 600 municipal governments have signed a motion against the U.S. federal government on its CO2 policy. I mean, you know, I, I just don't think you would see that in France or in the Netherlands or in Germany. But boy, in this country, that I, I sort of like that, you know, that everybody goes fighting. By the way, big footnote, big footnote, you know that we the... I have, in my, in my own research, I have been tracking the rights, I've been doing this for 20 years, more or less, huh? the rights that we, the citizens, are losing. So we have lost, over the last 20 years, quite a few rights. So we ha used to have standing in lower order courts where we could contest. We've lost that right. And when it comes to the environmental question, this can have implications. You know, because you can have particular communities very interested in making a claim, in contesting a, a rule, and somehow we've lost the right. Now, there was a period of 20 years when we kept losing rights. And it really begins a bit with the neoliberal era. I don't know if that word, I try not to use that word, neoliberal. But you know what I mean, right, or not? Yeah? Well, we can talk about that another time, maybe. So these transnational municipal governments um, uh, networks, that is something, you know, that it, it's fairly well done. Right now, one of the key leaders is Ana Hidalgo, the mayor of, uh, the mayor of Paris, who's, uh, who's actually Spanish origin. Huh? I speak Spanish with her. I love that. I mean, I, I don't know, I sort of like it, you know, that the French, for a while, they had a prime minister who was from Spain. And they had, I mean, born in Spain, whatever, spoke Spanish. And then the mayor of, um, the mayor of Paris also. Uh, so transnational blah, blah, we saw that. Oh, party's over. Okay, very good. Thank you, people. <laughs>